because we've really struggled to work out what um, narrative synthesis is in terms of its defining what it, what it is, um, we thought, well, why do people use narrative synthesis? So we thought, well, there's a range of reasons. And one reason might be that people are a little bit frightened if they don't have statistical expertise. But to be honest, I don't think that's really a good enough reason. Performing a sort of basic meta-analysis is not a particularly difficult thing, um, although you would want to make sure that you had some sort of statistical um, guidance on it, but don't think that's a good enough reason. Um, another reason might be that you don't have the data to calculate standardised effect sizes. And in some topics, maybe some of the less clinical topics like public health, certainly in the past, it's been quite common for studies to be not that well reported and so they don't maybe uh, present uh, a measure of variance, and you can't always calculate as, or transform your data into standardised effect sizes. And the risk there, there is that you might not be able to include all your data into the meta-analysis. So if you do decide to do a meta-analysis, you're at risk of underrepresenting the body of evidence. So for example, one of the reviews we did for some of the outcomes um, for 40% of the studies, we couldn't calculate standardised effect sizes. So if we'd drawn conclusions for the re review on the meta-analysis, we wouldn't have been basing it on the complete body of evidence. And we didn't want to do that. Another common reason, which I'm sure many of you will have seen in reviews, or maybe even have sort of used yourself, is that people um, see are um, uh, conscious that if data are very heterogeneous, they maybe need to be careful about synthesising the data. So this sort of statement is seen in a lot of reviews. High levels of heterogeneity contraindicated meta-analysis, so the data were synthesised narratively. The problem is that people don't really explain this, um, and they then go on and, as Vary will explain, they don't really explain then how they manage the data. So I thought it might be worth spending a couple of minutes talking about what we mean by heterogeneity. So there's different sources of heterogeneity. And often this is not really discussed much in uh, the reviews that we've looked at. So there's three main sources, there's statistical, methodological, and then clinical diversity. If we think about statistical heterogeneity, this is usually um, assessed formally by an I-square test. And this really considers how the effects vary in terms of direction and whether or not the, the um, confidence interval overlaps with the line of no effect. And you can see here um, in one forest plot where there's not much heterogeneity and another where there's a very high level, you can see immediately really that it wouldn't make sense particularly to, to pull these different effect sizes that are on the either side of the line of no effect together because you could end up with a conclusion that says there's no effect when in fact in some studies there's very strong effects. So this doesn't always make sense and this is why people caution against meta-analyzing when there's high levels of statistical heterogeneity. Then there's methodological heterogeneity. So um, increasingly reviews um, will be include non-randomized studies and not just RCTs, or they might include continuous and binary outcome measures. So that can um, introduce quite high levels of het methodological heterogeneity in, in your view. And the advice would be that you know you would need to consider whether and justify whether or not you can be combining RCTs and non-randomized studies together. And then there's clinical heterogeneity or clinical diversity. And by that we mean sort of um, variation in aspects of the PICO, so the population intervention comparison and outcome. So for example, there might be different measures of respiratory health um, reported and you might think, well, that's quite heterogeneous, like wheeze and peak flow and cough. And how do you manage that? So and very often people will say, well, you can't combine two things that are not the same. You can't combine apples and oranges because synthesis is about combining things that are similar. But there, this is really a matter of perspective. 
and your decision about whether or not you can combine two things that are not identical but are similar will depend a lot on how much data you have and how similar the, the, the two things or the group of outcomes or something are and what's then going to be useful to the review consumer. So you may say, well, we don't want to combine apples and oranges, but if you have very small amounts of data, maybe it would be useful to combine different types of fruits, for example, into fruit salad. But if you do this, then it, you need to report that you, the outcomes that you've grouped together um, to, in, and you've assumed that are common to, to justify this. So the decisions about whether or not you can combine different things and, and manage heterogeneity are sort of judgment calls, but you need to make them transpar transparent. But as this important paper from John Eoanidis um, outlines, this is from, from about 20, 2009, I think, this paper, um, he and his colleagues are saying, you know, people often avoid meta-analysis. It's very common. And they might have different justifications for doing this. But I think um, in this paper, they were sort of saying you should continue where possible to perform meta-analysis, but just um, interpret the findings appropriately um, and perhaps with some caution. So come back to the um, apple and oranges um, an analogy. Um, certainly in the Cochrane reviews we looked at, it's very common for authors to treat small differences between in, in the PICO, so between interventions or populations or outcomes, as too difficult or too different to synthesise, as so say the data are too heterogeneous. But the difficulty with this is that you end up with a review that splits up studies, so you end up really with on, only one or maybe two studies in each group or each outcome group. So when we looked at these Cochrane reviews, we found that 70% of the reviews that didn't perform meta-analysis actually didn't perform any type of synthesis because they considered the outcomes or the interventions in, in each study to be too different. And the problem with that is, although um, it might not be criticised from a, a sort of orthodox methods point of view, the problem with is you've, you've got so little evidence in each group that you're not able to draw any conclusions apart from saying, there's not enough evidence to draw any conclusions. And I think it's worth asking how useful that is to the potential users of the review. So it makes me think again about this analogy of the engine, that people break things up a lot, but they don't think about what's going to be useful and whether or not it's worth pulling things together to, to make things to make the review and the findings of the review more useful. And this is another analogy that I think is quite useful um, by a Swiss artist called Ursus Verley. So he's done a lot of work on sort of breaking up art. And in this picture of the lady in the swimsuit, he's broken it all up. And you can see immediately that you can't work out really at all what the picture would be. It looks quite pretty, but it's difficult to know what it is. And it's actually not much use. And this reminds me a bit about um, some of the data we collected when we were doing some consultation with decision makers in the UK about the usefulness of reviews. And here are a couple of quotes, one saying, we have extremely high quality, methodologically perfect reviews that are completely useless. Whenever you're looking for evidence, the Cochrane reviews are a must read, but they're not always useful because they're so rigorous. The level of rigour in a Cochrane review just does take them down the road of saying, well, we're not sure, and that can make it difficult for us compiling the evidence base on whether it works or not. And I think, if we're honest, this is a common criticism of reviews, not just Cochrane reviews, that um, they often end up with very uncertain conclusions. And we maybe need to think about how we can make reviews more useful. So why do people... Um, why do people, or why why might we want to continue to synthesise effect data when you can't do a meta-analysis? Well, I think I've outlined the sort of main points here: is that it makes use of best available evidence. 
So it might allow you to avoid concluding that we know nothing just because there are no randomised trials or because there's a mix of randomised trials and non-randomised trials. It might also allow you to incorporate all the available data when you're not able to calculate standardised effect sizes for all the studies. And it's particularly useful when the evidence are from different uh, sort of diverse study types and study designs. And it also allows you to make use of heterogeneity and the sort of rich data that you might find in studies about what works for who in what circumstances um, and, and examine sort of why um, the effects may be varying across different contexts or populations. So it's particularly useful for reviews which incorporate um, complexity. But it's worth remembering that if you're doing a synthesis without meta-analysis, your review is probably going to answer a slightly different question to a typical review that is about an effect size. So a meta-analysis really addresses the question of how big is the overall effect size. And if you don't do a, a statistical meta-analysis of effect sizes, you won't be able to answer this question. And the narrative synthesis, the purpose is slightly different. It's much more about the organisation of the data and being able to find the relationships um, in the data and the variation in what works for who in what circumstances. Um, so it, it's, you, if you end up doing a review like this, you'll probably be quite limited with respect to addressing um, questions of effectiveness and effect size. What the review is more likely to address is about the existence, nature and direction of the effect. <clears throat> 